So the scientific approach to knowledge. So chemists are, are trying to figure out matter by looking at the atoms and molecules and how do we approach this. Um, it's an empirical approach. Um, empirical referring to experiment. And so we observe things and we do experiments. This is different than a philosophical approach where you just sit and kind of think about things. Chemistry involves some thinking, but it also involves doing. So the, what we call the scientific method is a process. So we, we observe nature and how it behaves, and then we do experiments to test those ideas. So the main points or main characteristics of the scientific method are observation, formulation of hypotheses, experimentation, and finally the formulation of laws and theories. And we'll talk about each of those individually. So observations are known as data. Um, you put something on a balance and you see how much it weighs. That's data. It's an observation. You look at something and observe its color. That's data as well. You observe that gasoline burns when it's ignited. That's an observation. That's data. So some data has numbers associated with it, but some data is qualitative. It's more descriptive. Um, back in the 1700s, and I'm not going to test you on the history of chemistry, but I think it's helpful to pull some of these historical examples in. So like these dates, um, they're there to give us some perspective. You do not need to memorize those things. So Antoine Lavoisier, uh, he was a French scientist, lived in the 1700s. He made careful measurements of the mass of objects before and after burning them in closed containers. And he observed that there was no change in the mass of the whole container bef from before burning to after burning. Now, if we think about burning stuff, probably what we're most familiar with is like a, a wooden log in the fireplace back when they actually let us burn wood in the fireplace, right? So you remember those days? Um, yeah, so you put a log in the fireplace and you have a nice roaring fire. Does the log weigh more, less, or the same after it's burned for three hours? Those ashes, do they weigh more, they less? They, they weigh the same as the log? You're shoveling those out and, no, they weigh less, right? Now, the total, if it was burned in a closed container, it would be the same, but the log weighs less. There are other things that if you burn them, they get heavier. Metals are like that. If you heat magnesium metal to a very high temperature, it will burn, and it actually gets heavier. What's that about? So Lavoisier noticed things like this, and he's like, I'm going to do an experiment. So he put them in closed containers, and he found that overall, the mass didn't change. So that's his observation. The observation leads to a hypothesis, because the scientist wants to know why. Why does it do that? So the hypothesis is a tentative interpretation or explanation. We say, well, I think this is what's happening. It's not a guess, necessarily, but we don't really trust our hypothesis until we've tested it a whole bunch of times. But we think about it, we say, well, I, I think this is what's happening. And his thought was that the substance burning is combining with a component of the air. That was his hypothesis. And so one of the important things about a hypothesis is it needs to be something that's falsifiable. It needs to be testable. If we can't test it, then it's no good because it's just an idea, a random idea that someone had. So a good hypothesis is falsifiable. So um, for those metals that get heavier when they burn, you know, how do they increase in mass? Well, his explanation was that they're combining with a component of the air. We now know that that's true. When magnesium burns, it combines with oxygen from the air and becomes magnesium oxide. So it traps the oxygen. What's happening with the wood that seems to lose mass? Well, there's a lot of carbon in wood. 
And that carbon, when it burns, combines with oxygen in the form of CO2, which is a gas, and floats up the chimney. And there's a lot of hydrogen in wood. The hydrogen combines with oxygen from the air and turns into water. And in that hot environment, the water is in a gas state, and the water floats up the chimney too. And so it looks like a whole bunch of that wood just like is gone, right? But by burning something in a closed container, you trap all those products, and you can weigh everything and see that, no, there was no mass that was lost or gained. We test experiment, I mean, we test hypotheses with experiments. Experiments are, are highly controlled procedures. We, we try to control everything that we possibly can. That's one of the things I like about chemistry is we are not dealing with living organisms. Living organisms, especially if you try to do, figure out stuff about humans, um, really hard to control. Um, but when you're doing it with inner, uh, inanimate objects, non-living things, it's much easier. So the results of the experiment can support the hypothesis or may prove it wrong. If it proves that your hypothesis is wrong, sometimes you have to just completely discard the hypothesis, start over with some other explanation. Other times you just need to modify the hypothesis. And then you test the new one. And so you go on and on and on, observing, making a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis, and then possibly modifying or finding new ways to test your hypothesis. Scientific laws and scientific theories are very important. And I want you to know the difference between a law and a theory. A law is a brief statement summarizing past observations, predicting future ones. Um, it says what happens. So a scientific law tells us, I'm having issues with my stylus apparently, tells us what happens. We'll see that a theory explains why that happens. Um, so the law of conservation of mass is the law that came out of Lavoisier's work. And it states that in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. So you can't make matter, you can't destroy matter in a chemical reaction. Um, originally, I believe this law stated that, leave this part out, matter is neither created nor destroyed. Well, then someone discovered nuclear chemistry. And in nuclear chemistry, matter can be created and it can be destroyed. Um, you can convert matter and energy. But that doesn't happen except in specialized situations. So we don't just throw out the hypothesis or the theory, I mean the law. We, we modify it in a chemical reaction as opposed to a nuclear reaction. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. So scientific laws are also subject to experiment. And that can prove them wrong or, or support them. The thing about scientific laws, they're very different than um, laws made by a government. You can choose to ignore the speed limit, right? And, and people do routinely. You cannot choose to violate a scientific law. Probably the most familiar scientific law is the law of gravity, right? And that predicts what's going to happen. So here I have a dry erase marker. And if I hold it out at shoulder level and let go of it, what does the law of gravity say is going to happen? It's going to fall. Sure enough, every single semester does that. The day it doesn't will be a strange day indeed. <laughs> the law of gravity, though, doesn't explain why the marker falls. In fact, scientists are still wrestling with the details of what exactly gravity is. We still don't completely understand that. But we do have a law that says what will happen, and we use that to predict future behavior. Because of that, we know that it's not a good idea to step off the top of a three-story building, right? Because you're going to fall down. That's just what's going to happen, and you can't choose not to. So scientific laws describe how nature behaves. They tell us what happens. 
a theory generally comes from one or more well-established hypotheses. So a scientist has a hypothesis, they test it and test it and test it, and other people test it and test it, and nobody can, can find any problem with it. So then it becomes a scientific theory. A theory is a model for the way nature is and tries to explain not merely what happens, what nature does, but why. So law says what, theory says why. So John Dalton um, came, came along um, a little bit after Lavoisier. His atomic theory explained the law of conservation of mass. By, by proposing that matter is composed of small indestructible particles called atoms, and because these particles, these atoms, are just rearranged in chemical changes, the total amount of mass is the same. So we can think of this in terms of Lego bricks. You have a small set of Lego bricks, and if you put it on a balance and, and weigh it, maybe you find out it weighs 10 grams. And then you put the pieces together and you make two little houses using all the pieces, and you stick that on the balance, still 10 grams. You take the houses apart and you make them into, I don't know, three trees or something. Is the mass of those Lego blocks going to change? No. Because you're using the same blocks, you're just putting them together in a different way. That's what a chemical reaction is. We're taking the atoms in the reactants and putting them together in new ways to make the products. That does not involve any changes in mass. And that's a very important concept. So theories are also tested. They're validated by experiments. We can never prove a theory to be true. And that's a little disturbing to, to some of us. You can't prove things to be true. You can only prove them to be not true. So a theory gives us this general explanation for the characteristics and behavior of nature. We can use it to predict future observations. A well-established theory is as close to truth as we can get in science. It means everything we know, everything we've done, can try to do, nobody can find a problem with this theory. Scientists being very skeptical and curious people are going to continue trying to find a problem with the theory. And so these theories do get tested and tested and tested. And that's part of how new discoveries are made. And then we have to modify the theories. The scientific method is not a set of directions, like um, the instructions building a Lego set, do this, 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 and this. Sometimes we would like that to be the case. Um, science is actually very messy. You try stuff and it doesn't work. And you try something else and it doesn't work. And sometimes it feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall. That's how my graduate work felt. It gives you a headache. We often go around in circles. So typically we start with an observation. And based on the observation, we make some sort of a hypothesis. And then we test it with an experiment. And we can get stuck in this loop for a professional lifetime, actually, um, around and around and around, testing it, modifying the hypothesis, testing it, modifying the hypothesis, um, and that just goes on and on and on. And, but, you know, scientists are somewhat crazy, and so we kind of enjoy that. Um, a law can also arise from observation. You know, people have observed that when you let go of stuff that's above the ground, it falls to the ground. Those sorts of observations general, gradually led to the law of gravity. And um, you could test the law of gravity um, over and over and over again. It's going to be confirmed. Um, and then theories come out of hypotheses um, explaining why these things are happening. And those are all tested and confirmed or revised and people go around and around over here. So there's a bunch of loops that you can get stuck in. But that's the general idea for science. Um, 
I find that myself as a scientist, I tend to apply the scientific method to solving problems in my everyday life. You know, the car starts making a weird noise. I don't just take it to the shop. I observe things. I observe, does it, does it make that noise when the engine's cold, when the engine's warm, when I'm moving, does it get more frequent, when I'm moving faster, I make all these observations. And then sometimes I'll, I'll come up with a hypothesis, like, well, I think this noise might be a stone in the tire. And of course, every time I get out of the car, I forget to look at the tire. But when I'm driving and I hear the noise, I think about it. I'm like, well, if it's a stone in the tire making a clicking sound on the pavement, then when I drive faster, it should get more frequent. And when I drive slower, it should get less frequent, right? So I'll do that and say, oh, yeah, that confirms my hypothesis. Well, the ultimate test is to get out and look at the stupid wheel, right? Anyway, you can apply that to all sorts of things, and it can actually make you um, just a more efficient person in everyday life to sort of study the little problems that come up in your life, develop a hypothesis, what do you think is going on, and then test it, make more observations and see. Okay, so we should be able to answer questions like this. Um, which statement best explains the difference between a law and a theory? A law is truth, whereas a theory is mere speculation. A law summarizes a series of related observations. A theory gives the underlying reasons for them. A theory describes what nature does, and a law describes why nature does it. Anybody want to go out on a limb? Oh. B. B. What? OK, so yesterday, I almost went for C. <laughs> It sounds so nice. What's wrong with C? Are they backwards? It's exactly backwards. A theory is why a law says what. OK? So it's, it's letter B. Um, the law is summarizing a series of related observations that we do this and this happens. We do this and this happens. A theory is the reasons for them. The first one's just. Not, wrong, not correct, because nothing is really truth. A law is not truth. And a theory being mere speculation, that's not correct either. Because in science, it's not just a theory. A theory is as close to truth as we can get. But it isn't truth. Any questions? <laughs>